recording now. Hello, everybody. This is Doug Fink. I organize the PowerShell meetup here in New York City, and I'm looking forward to tonight. We're going to have uh, Heiko Bren give a talk uh, about make PowerShell a real solution in five steps. He works for ScriptRunner, and I want a big shout out to ScriptRunner. They're um, sponsoring this meetup and, and several other things. We're really quite happy with that. Thank you very much to them. And uh, we'll get back to kicking this off in a second. I just also want to bring your attention to, uh, I'll put this in the chat. This is the YouTube channel I have, and this is where I post all the meetups that we do. I record them and put them up here. These are the past ones. Uh, I'll put, again, I'll put that into the chat. You want to get on here and probably subscribe and hit the notification button so you know when I post uh, new videos for upcoming meetups that we do. I also post other YouTube videos uh, on PowerShell uh, that I do, as well as other people. Uh, so it's a good it's a good source of uh, PowerShell information if you want to keep an eye on this. So next month, just want to let you know we're looking at bringing in Jason Helmick to do a talk. Jason Helmick is the product manager of the PowerShell tool, uh, the PowerShell language. And he's going to join us. Uh, we're working out some dates towards the end of January. Uh, so you want to, you know, you're already on the meetup and you've uh, connect, connected to the meetup. So when I set, publish that, we'll get an announcement of when he's going to go through uh, the PowerShell roadmap. We're going to talk about the new released crescendo uh, piece that they did. Um, which is a really interesting piece of technology. I tweeted about it and put some stuff up on uh, the PowerShell Facebook links. Uh, looks like a really interesting tool. I won't get into what it is. And he'll also be covering some of the new uh, features, uh, the prediction models, the prediction aspects that uh, the new PowerShell 7 has and some other uh, cool things that he's going to bring to the table. So that'll be next month. Um, what else? So if you want to ask questions, feel free to raise your hand in the chat and I'll look to unmute you, or you can just drop your question into the chat and we can ask questions from beginning to end. You'll wanna stay on to the end of the presentation. Heiko's going to be, we'll drop a link in there that you can put your email, and then Heiko's gonna run a, a script runner process that uh, grab a couple of random names and you'll win one of two Amazon gift cards. So that'll be at the end of tonight's presentation. So you wanna stick around for that. So start the kit, let's kick this off. So we're gonna talk about PowerShell as a real solution in five steps. And Heiko's gonna discuss that. He's a PowerShell enthusiast, the product expert at ScriptRunner, the PowerShell management company. He's been working in IT for more than 25 years in a number of different roles like IT administrator, consultant, and product manager. And Heiko, it's really good, good to have you. You're based over in Germany, so I know it's pretty late for you. Um, let me unmute you, see if that works. Hey yeah, there. I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Thanks. so I'm going to kick it over to you, and you can share your screen, and looking forward to the presentation. Excellent. Thanks, Zach. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for, thanks for having me. So, yeah, I'm going to start to share my screen, though. That's so the first step. Okay, that seems to work. I can see it. Excellent. All right. So, yeah, um, I want to talk about um, how to make PowerShell a real solution and uh, also give you an introduction into what script runner is, what we're doing, why it might be interesting for you. Uh, and as, as Doug said at the end, we are also going to give away um, a few things. So, we're going to have a small raffle as well that might be interesting for you. And um, so, Let's start with a few slides first. So who is ScriptRunner actually? Um, just give you a short introduction. So we are into PowerShell management. So our goal really is to simplify the way you develop, uh, manage and, and delegate um, your PowerShell scripts and everything that comes with it like credentials uh, and all the other bits and pieces you need to in order to run uh, PowerShell in a, in a secure and uh, well-organized way. 
Um, we are based, as Doug said, we are based in Germany. We are about uh, 20 people. This is a picture of part of our, our team. So that is me. So you can get in touch with me on all the different uh, channels on, on Twitter, of course, on LinkedIn, uh, GitHub, stuff like that. And we are very much into also working just like today, working with the community and, and helping people to work with PowerShell. And one way we are actually doing that is uh, providing a PowerShell poster uh, that is kind of a cheat sheet that, that helps you with your day-to-day -day business when it comes to using PowerShell. So if you're interested in that, um, you can uh, order that for free. We send this out as a physical, actually two physical copies and you can put it on, on your office wall and it gives you information about um, how pipelining works and things like that, that you might uh, want to get answers quickly when you are into your PowerShell uh, scripting. Um, so this is something that might be also might be interesting for you. So yeah, so what, what does it mean when we say, okay, we wanna make PowerShell a real solution uh, in five steps? Um, so if we, we talk to, to many organizations and administrators and PowerShell people, and we uh, always hear that there are, of course, a couple of, of challenges when it comes to using PowerShell. So like the, in this picture here, uh, that might look familiar when you think about your PowerShell scripts and thinking about, okay, where, where are they stored? Uh, how do I find the latest version so I can make sure I'm doing the right thing especially if I want to give this to somebody else to run a script, to get something done, like spinning up a VM, um, creating new users, uh, creating new teams or whatever. So we, in, often we see this, okay, we have this many different versions of, of, of our scripts and we maybe sometimes they're even in some emails and stuff like that. So this is uh, one of the challenges that, that we see quite often. And also when we think about how to manage the credentials in on an org wide level to, to really make sure you can use your PowerShell scripts, not just yourself, but really getting it to or take PowerShell to a level where you can say, okay, I can, I can delegate tasks that can be run by PowerShell to people maybe in help desk or maybe even to end users. And that of course uh, requires a, a proper credential management. And what we also of course see quite often is that outside of the IT teams, um, we see PowerShell know how bottlenecks. So let's say if you want to give a PowerShell script to somebody in help desk, that might be already being a challenge, telling them how PowerShell works to get them getting, getting familiar with the command line and, and, and stuff like that. And I mean, we all know that we can do great things with PowerShell if you know how it works, if you um, are familiar uh, with working with PowerShell and if you're having uh, the right permissions and that typically of course applies to to the IT people so the goal uh, and the, the thing that we that we see here is that really when we look at how PowerShell is being used uh, in general it's it's something that the IT guys are running maybe sometimes it's a help desk uh, but then that's already starts uh, to become an issue and become uh, quite difficult and that from our perspective really means that the potential of using PowerShell the technology to manage all kinds of Backend systems on premise in the cloud um, hybrid. It's really this potential is cannot be realized on, a, on, a, on an organizational wide level because of this, uh, this limitation, so to speak. And um, so, and this is ex exactly where Script Runner comes into the picture. And the one of the main concepts here is really centralizing all the different aspects when it comes to using PowerShell. And, uh, and that's because we want to, of course, standardize. We want to make sure you always have the right versions of, of the scripts. Everybody is on the, on the same version, on the same page, if they start doing an onboarding and things like that, no matter if it's, if it's, if it's used by user A or user B. Um, so it's really about having a standardized approach here, um, which also means, of course, then starting to use PowerShell scripts in team or in multiple teams, maybe throughout the whole organization. It's also about, of course, writing scripts together in, in team or multiple teams. And what comes into the picture here, of course, also is monitoring. So if we think about running running scripts um, and, uh, and, and letting it be, be used by other people, we wanna have a proper monitoring system. We wanna know which script ran, ran at what time, how long did it take, was there an issue, who triggered that script, for example. And um, which also means, of course, 
uh, we have to think about the security aspects here, which is kind of twofold. One is, as I mentioned uh, before, is like, okay, we need to have a proper cred credential management. So if, whenever the script runs, tries to establish a session to a backend system that this is done in a secure way. And the other aspect is that and if we think about delegating um, the execution of PowerShell scripts or the, the triggering of PowerShell scripts, it's, it's what's important here is that, of course, if we think about this going to be people maybe in, in your service desk teams or maybe even uh, people in your line of business, of course, you don't want to make this and you're not allowed to make this people kind of global admin in your Office 65 tenant or in your Azure subscription or in your exchange environment and stuff like that. So this is, of course, something that also um, becomes possible when, when we think about centralizing all the um, aspects of PowerShell. And that's really where then delegation kicks in, where we can start, okay, we can start thinking about getting people to use the possibilities of PowerShell, maybe without even knowing it, that it's PowerShell that's, that's the trick underneath. So it's really kind of, if you think of a, a very high level, it's like really, you could say it's kind of democrat democratizing PowerShell in the sense of that maybe people that maybe never even heard about PowerShell can start using it. Uh, and then of course, besides having people uh, triggering uh, scripts and uh, of course having a scheduled approach, which I'm also gonna show you in, in my demo uh, in just a second. The, it's also of course about having other third party people uh, and third party solutions being able to trigger the execution of PowerShell scripts in uh, and in script runners. So let's let it be monitoring system, workflow system, ITSM systems to get this into the picture as well. And so centralizing really is the key component here. And what we're actually doing, and this is coming back to this five-step approach that that is is the is kind of the the headline of this of this session is it all starts with the scripts and the modules. So we are centralizing all the scripts in a single place, which also includes, of course, having the possibility to synchronize that with your GitHub repo or with your TFS or Azure DevOps. Um, so we're having all scripts in a single place. The same is, of course, true for the, for the modules, which, which is another, of course, important thing. If you're, if you're thinking about using PowerShell for, for Azure, for Office 65, or for VMware, stuff like that, you always, if you, if you think about giving that script to somebody you, and you have to make sure, does, is this module installed over there? By centralizing the whole process, of course, it's only just, just a single place to maintain that as well. Credential, as I said, is another, of course, very important aspect. And there are two ways of, of um, managing these credentials within Script Runner. One is using the built-in Windows Credential Store. The other, the other aspect is using um, password servers. At the moment, we support three of them, CyberArk, Pleasant, and Psychotic. We are also having a, a I would say, a pre-implementation of using the, the, uh, the Credential Manager module um, so that's going to be uh, the, the fourth way of, of uh, managing the credentials. And um, what's, I think, what's quite interesting, and that's why I'm going to zoom in here, what's quite interesting is to understand that if we talk about using script runner, the only instance that's actually executing the scripts is always a script runner, which means only a script runner needs to have access to your backend systems, no matter if it's on-premises, in the cloud, or hybrid. So only script runner executes the scripts, talks to the backend system, needs to have access to the credentials. And that's why we call it here the execution proxy layer, so to speak. So all the good stuff around PowerShell with managing the scripts, running the scripts, managing the credentials, stuff like that, that happens within script runner. On the, on the other side, if we look at the user that you might want to enable to start an onboarding and offboarding, um, spinning up new VMs, creating a new SharePoint site or whatever, this user are talking to a script runner and based on a delegation based in script runner, this user are able to ex actually trigger um, this execution. Like, as I said, the different use cases here. And um, which means that this users, number one, they don't have to have any backend access to these systems because that's all done by script runner. And number two, of course, because of that, they don't need to have any permissions in this backend system because that's again all managed by a script runner, and that really uh, is something that uh, makes it 
on one hand quite secure, uh, quite easy for the user, and of course very secure because uh, you're really having having that central piece, which is the script runner management layer, to make that to make it happen. And because we're talking about people that uh, are not in the ex ex PowerShell expert circle, so to speak, it has to be easy. And so what we're doing here is we automatically transform your PowerShell scripts into a web user interface. Uh, what does that mean? So we, we, here we have an example for spinning up, uh, create, creating a new Microsoft team. And here we see, okay, there are obviously that there, there's three parameters are um, visible here. And if you know the new team command, let you know that there are many more parameters that you can use. So what happens here is that, um, one thing is we automatically create this web user interface without any additional code. The other thing is that you can control what you actually display to the user, which means in the background things like how you gonna uh, how you wanna organize the channels, the security settings, like uh, allowing Giphy's yes or no, all these things. They are all there in the configuration, but we only display the information that really needs the attention of the user, and that's. A, a very great way to really make sure users are it's going to be it's, it's easy um people just seeing and can be can selecting the things that you want them to to see uh, and in the background you can of course use all the things that this the commandlets are uh, providing in a centralized and in a very uh, easy controlled way and with this then you can uh, we're, we're talking about really taking recurring tasks and delegate them to these people in service desk and user stuff like that. And as a result here, we see a screenshot of a delegate app that I'm going to show you uh, also in the demo. Um, and so in this case, six use cases has been, have been uh, delegated to this user and depending on the configuration within script runner, maybe a user sees two tiles. So each tile represents a use case. Um, or maybe maybe it's going to be 20 tiles. They, they are organized in tabs based maybe on, on your, and categorized based on your backend uh, platforms and stuff like that. So it becomes, again, really easy for these people to work with, um, yeah, to work with PowerShell actually, but maybe they even just, they don't even see it. They don't even know it that, that underneath that there is PowerShell doing the trick. Um, and the, the fifth step here really is um, to integrate that whole solution into your infrastructure, into your processes, into your workflows. So to enable, for example, a monitoring system to trigger a script when maybe a sensor detects an error and the resolution is to, to restart a service or to enhance a VM or stuff like that. Um, and um, even if these monitoring systems have some PowerShell capabilities, typically people tend to do this in script runner because with script runner, they have this centralized PowerShell hub for all activities. And that really helps people to, to work with uh, and, and to use PowerShell in a, in a very uh, manageable and well-organized way. And um, talking about the, the scripts, of course, that, 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 that are necessary to do that, um, we are actually providing uh, many, many ready-to-use scripts on our GitHub repo. Um, and uh, so for many different platforms, in the, uh, in the cloud or on-premise, like Exchange, OS 65, Azure, VMware, um, Teams, stuff like that. So you can just take this, depending on where you are on your PowerShell journey, it might help you to start with that stuff. And of course, uh, if you're advanced here, uh, then of course it might be a, a source of maybe inspiration to see what else could you do with, with, with PowerShell. So this is something that we also provide for the, com for the community. Um, so to really um, use or be able to use PowerShell in a, again in a very easy and straightforward way. And with this, I will switch to my demo environment. So enough PowerPoint. So let's dig into the real thing. So I'm going to share a different screen. It's going to be this one here. That hopefully works. So here we see um, our script runner solution, which is actually the admin app. And um, as I mentioned, it all starts with the script. So here I have all my scripts that I'm using here on my machine. It's about, I think it's, yeah, we can see here it's a 1000 something scripts. And as I mentioned, 
we have this GitHub repo with these action packs. And so most of the scripts are really started with using this information that we have here uh, on GitHub. So if you're interested, you can always go to github.com slash script runner action packs. And here you see all these different scripts, uh, again, for O65, for Azure, for Exchange, for Active Directory and, and stuff like that. And, and it's kind of, um, it, it's, and you will see it, it's, it, it's standard PowerShell. We, we can also see that it follows the best practice of Microsoft which also, for example, includes the parameter descriptions, which is quite uh, interesting and helpful because this is one way how we actually take the information from your script and transform it into, a, into this uh, web user interface because these descriptions help us to um, get this description into the, into the uh, front end so the user know what parameter is, is there, what is, what's it doing. And you might also realize that we, for example, also support different languages that if the user switches, in this case, from English to German, that the user interface also follows this and shows the right descriptions, for example. Uh, and you might also see that there are additional um, yeah, information, so to speak, that we provide to help working with PowerShell. And how that works, I will show you. Uh, when we go through the different uh, use cases here. So again, it all starts with the scripts. Uh, we are very heavily um, working with tagging here. So if I just want to get my Azure scripts here, I, I, can, I can use my filter. I can also use a global filter that applies for all the different objects within Script Runner. And here you also might notice that um, we are not, we, if, if, a, if a script contains functions, we also detect that, which means you can later on decide if you want to work with just a, a particular function within a script, like for delegating purposes, or if you want to work with the, with the complete script. Uh, and so again, so here, you, you, if you want to just get to know, I want to have my Office 65 scripts here, for example, I get that, that here. And as I said, of course, you can sync that with, for example, with your, with, with your Git repo. And I also going to show you this, how this works uh, later on. So step one, we have our script. Step two, we need the credentials. So here I have the credentials for my different backend systems. And uh, I have a combination of credentials that I store locally in my Windows credential store. We additionally, we additionally encrypt them. Oh, yeah, this is Doug. Yeah, just got a couple of questions in the... Um, yes. Uh, one of the questions, sorry to interrupt. Uh, is there RBAC support for end users? So, sorry, I didn't... Uh... RBAC, R-B-A-C, uh, support for end users. Uh, when it comes to using script runner, you mean? Uh, I believe, Jim, do you want to just type a little more? I believe that's what he's asking. Yeah, yeah. So, so it it is uh, that that's something that of course is being recognized by script runner and can be used within script runner. Um, also for well, number one for um, yeah, authenticating against script runner, but also of course using that. Uh, capabilities within within the process of you of, of of running scripts and and using the different actions. Yes. Awesome. And does it support uh, 2FA for user logins? Um, at the moment, um, we it, it's not available for the for the authentication, but we're working on on that. It it is available, and I'm going to show you that uh, when we're talking about. Um, the targets, so the, the backend systems that we want to talk to, uh, which also includes modern authentication with certificates when it comes to, for example, Exchange Online and stuff like that. So that's part of the solution. And as Microsoft is kind of also switching from the good old user password um, um, world into the, the certificate-based world, of course, that, that's, going to, that's, that's going to change how we work. And of course, also, if we think about a PowerShell 7 uh, working against Wind, uh, Linux and Mac OS, of course, you can also uh, store the SSH keys to configure these connections to this uh, Linux and Mac OS um, backends as well. Great. And uh, so this opened up a couple more questions. Can, uh, can we integrate with Azure AD? Yes. Yes. Um, so this is actually something that that's uh, quite interesting. So maybe I'm going to show you this right now because with the with the new version that we just that we just published, um, you can you can use Azure Active Directory for authentication. Which means, like in this case here, I have Script Runner as an instance on in Azure. So it's, I have an Azure VM running, uh, and um, for authenticating here in Script Runner, I have configured my 
administration group here as users from my Azure Active Directory. Um, so if you're in a, for example, if you're in a cloud only environment, uh, there's, and there is no Active Directory, and you, obviously you don't want to use local identity on this, on this very box, of course, then you can switch to Azure Active Directory, then they're going to be uh, two app registrations um, that enable ScriptRunner to talk to Azure, and then you can use Azure for authentication. Um, and you can, of course, also use it, uh, and we will see that later on, uh, to create queries uh, within within Azure and Microsoft and using Microsoft Graph and things like that. Cool, cool. And one last question, and then you can go on with where you were. Uh, do you work with Jenkins? Uh, not so much. So we have actually customers uh, using both um, because they are kind of having, I would say, from from, from what we hear, I mean, they're having different different. Uh, positionings and different ways where they are good at and how you can use it. So we, we see working these things uh, uh, side by side in, in some cases. Um, and it really depends what, what really for us is important or for our customers is if, if PowerShell is one of your strategic technologies to implement your automation, then ScriptRunner is the perfect tool. Of course, if you have other um, other goals, so for example, you might add other solutions like Jenkins or, or other platforms as well. And then typically they just, uh, as I said, just uh, exist side by side. Gotcha. Great, okay. No more questions at the moment, thank you. Okay, so uh, no problem. So we are right into the topic, which is great. So yeah, so having, having uh, the credential is one thing. So, um, and as I said, you, you can use um, password servers in my environment. I have a pleasant server up and running in uh, locally here. So let's say if I'm having an action, a script that, that wants to connect uh, to exchange, then the credential will be, will be uh, requested via a script runner um, from the pleasant server, which means that of course, and that's one of the main thing here, of course, and based on this, of this ID of this credential in this password server, um, that of course, with with having that approach, there's no user credential information, whatever, whatsoever in your scripts because it's all managed within ScriptRunner. Um, and so, of course, this is one of the, the, the main things to, to really ensure you have a secure environment if you're using uh, PowerShell. So we have the scripts, then we have the credentials. And now it's about, okay, what, how are we using, how are we going to use these credentials? Um, it's uh, so this is where, where the targets come into the picture and targets are things like your Office 65 um, tenant, your Azure subscription, your local SharePoint servers or whatever. And so what, what happens here is if, I, if I'm looking at this here, um, so here we have this list of the credentials that we just looked at. So I'm just selecting and saying, okay, every time later on, I'm going to use that target to do something in this tenant, this is going to be uh, the credential. And as I said, of course, we are having, uh, coming up with all this new modern authentication possibilities. Of course, this is something um, that you can use here as well. And as I said, as Microsoft is, is, is changing that strategy and, and that's become more and more of, a, of the standard, we, we will see that possibilities here in, in script runner as well. And uh, which also here, by the way, means that you can, that you can configure what kind of um, endpoints you are want to enable in this target, um, maybe just Exchange or it's going to be uh, Microsoft Teams as well, um, stuff like that. And um, so, so this this is how you can configure these this, uh, targets. And of course, these targets follow all the good stuff that you can do with PowerShell, which means you can do you can have uh, local execution targets, you can have PowerShell remoting targets, which also means that, of course, again, here we, we talk about uh, using SSH for PowerShell 7 against Linux and Mac OS, um, or if you want to talk to containers or stuff like that, um, and, or if, you, if you're using um, PowerShell remoting and you would like to talk to a GIA endpoint from ScriptRunner because the actual backend system is not accessible directly from the ScriptRunner, instance, you can configure all that stuff, like jump hosts as well. Um, and um, so, so to really to be able to, to kind of 
be able to work in all kinds of different environments where you have uh, different security settings, different infrastructures and stuff like that. You can even um, combine um, targets into, we just saw that into target collections, which is pretty helpful, especially for housekeeping processes. If you say, okay, I later on, I gonna have, I wanna have scheduled, uh, a scheduled action that runs every weekend, go through my uh, tenants to do some, uh, to archive, uh, data or maybe delete data, then you can really take this, let's say you have 10 um, or 65 tenants, you can put that into a collection and can say, okay, I have one action that goes, that takes all these different um, tenants in the background, either in sequence or maybe even in parallel, you can configure what should happen if a connection to one uh, target fails, should the whole process um, stop or do you want to skip just this single uh, backend system and just go to the next one? Um, this is something that you can, that you can, that you can very easily um, configure here within Script Runner. So we have the scripts, we have the credentials, and we have the targets. And with this, we can start creating uh, what we call actions. And an action is something that really brings together all the bits and pieces and make make it a use case that you can also then later on start um, delegating. And um, I want to start by just building in a new action here um, and I'm going to take, just as a simple example, I'm going to take a script that creates um, a new team. Let, let me just check this one. So this this is one script that I'm, I'm having here on my machine and I say, okay, I want to make this a new action. Now what I can do within Script Runner, for example, here is, um, because uh, you, you can you can we can work with what we kind of uh, a team structure within Script Runner. What does that mean? So if you might have administrators that should work with Script Runner, but they are only responsible for the Azure scripts, the Azure credentials, the Azure targets, or only for the Exchange environment. And so to make sure that the Azure guys are not messing up with the Exchange scripts, for example, or the Exchange actions, you can configure this here. Um, within Script Runner, so so to make sure you have one instance of Script Runner, but multiple teams working with it, and they don't interfere with each other. Um, and um, as uh, the next step, of course, okay, I need a I need a, a name for this action. Let's make this a very creative one. So here again, of course, we see the tagging, and the tagging actually always starts with the underlying folder structure. So the folder structures where the scripts are actually stored automatically become tags that can be used uh, here for the configuration. The second part is then, okay, where do we want to, how do we want to run that? What kind of target are we going to use? So in this case, it's about teams. So I'm selecting my Office 65 tenant. I could also, depending on the use case, I could also select multiple targets here. So, but in my case, I'm, I'm using uh, this Office 65 tenant. Uh, and then with this, um, well, I can just say, okay, and see what happened because now I can go to my list of my actions. And now we should see this new action that I just created, um, which is this one. And so what I can do here, I can click on run down here. And remember, I'm still in the admin context. Uh, later on, we're going to switch to how that looks like if I'm somebody from service desk for example. So um, here I have that script that obviously contains all the different parameters that, that this new team command that is providing. So what I could do here and what I see here is um, because of this, this exclamation mark, this is obviously a mandatory parameter. Um, so it's, it's something I have to type in so to make it work. So my Expectation would be if I'm having filled out the whole, uh, everything that's mandatory, I should see this okay button down here to run this. But in this case, it's not, it's not the case. And I will show you why that is. Um, so I'm going back into the edit mode and we are looking at the configuration of the parameters. And what we see here is that in this case, and it would not be necessary, but I just put it in here just so I can show it to you, that there is another um, PS credential that 
um, is necessary to in order to make this work. And because it's mandatory, we can see that here again, the exclamation mark. And um, so I'm going to hit okay. And I'm running, I'm clicking on run again. So I wanna create this team, New York user group 001. And now I can see this is, there is this okay button. So I'll click on that. And um, so what, and what you saw, and we're going to go back there again, of course, this list of parameters and the descriptions and the fact that uh, parameters are mandatory or, or other settings, this is all automatically created from the script. And okay, here we have another error. And it's also is a good way to show how the reports works because here, um, I mean, now I'm the administrator, but later on, it could be just a user from service desk. I can see who triggered that script and this action, what was the target. So it went to over 65. Um, and it, this is the credential that is being used. And I see the parameter value input um, that I've provided. And I see something else as a result message um, that there is obviously something was not recognized within this action. And that's because, and that's also something I want, I want to show you is um, because we're talking about simplifying the way that you also develop your scripts, right? Um, which means centralizing functions into library scripts. And this is exactly something that we provide here with Script Runner because here in the PowerShell settings, you could say, okay, with this um, script that I'm running as my main use case, I want to preload a library script that contains all the functions that this main script might need, which would be in this case, the disconnect to Teams. Obviously, because we have a default of a 65 tenant, normally I wouldn't need that, but I just want to show you that so you get the understanding how the whole concept works. Also, for example, with the library scripts here. So now um, let's go back to that action and run it again. Again, let's try it again. Um, and click on OK. So, and what, you, what I can do here is as an administrator down here in the upper, in the lower right corner, I can click on that uh, icon here. I can see in real time what actually happens in the background. Again, of course, it's the administrator that, uh, that triggered this uh, communication here. Uh, we can see now what, what happens in the background connecting to, to Azure AD, and in this case, starting to create that team. Um, and when it's all done, we get some information back that tells us, okay, the, the execution and the, the, uh, was successful. Um, now, going back to this, to this example here, um, maybe to give you an idea how these bits and pieces work together, we can click here on this details button, which shows us what components these actions actually uh, um, contains. So, we have this use case creating a team. Um, we have a target over 65. This is using this credential to connect to um, over 65. We obviously also have a library script enabled. That's the actual script um, that is being used. And this is the additional uh, uh, PS credential that is part of that configuration. Um, and um, if I would like to make, um, yeah, changes, uh, adding something, then of course, from here, I can always go to the edit uh, mode and also, of course, go back to the action itself. Because what I typically would like to do, and so I'm going to switch to a action that I have already configured is I that, know. yes. Got a, I got a couple of questions. Sure. Um, and I think Nasir, um, I'll try to rephrase your question that somehow I lost the chat window and I lost what you were talking about. But uh, I think the general question was like, can we just plug our scripts in here or do we have to uh, rewrite or add a lot of different pieces to our, our existing scripts to make it plug into, um, into script runner? Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes sense as a question. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you can take your script as they are and put them into a script runner, which, which basically means uh, putting it here in a, in a folder structure and saying, okay, these are, these are my scripts that I want to use. Um, and, um, so that that's of course that's that's an approach that always that almost almost works. Um, of course, depending on 
the structure, like what I just said with the library scripts, and we, we're going to see another uh, aspect of having this, uh, having other uh, category of scripts, um, it kind of in the long run helps to think about the strategy of how to organize the script, having a main script, having the, the library, the function scripts, having, having the query scripts. Um, and um, so technically you can just take every script and put it into script runner um, from the organizational point of view uh, to make real, to make the most or get the most benefit out of script runner. Sometimes it's, it's really about, okay, we are going to change um, the structure of a script. Maybe sometimes it's, it starts with things like, okay, at, uh, right now we haven't used the parameter description in the synopsis because we didn't have any use for it, which obviously changed with script runner because now the parameter description automatically becomes the stuff that you see here that helps the user to understand what, what is this parameter all about. Um, so one thing is the, the technical approach, just taking your script, copy it in there, it becomes available, you can create the action that will work. And the other thing is how you want to provide this user interface. And that, for example, um, uh, relates to that uh, parameter description. So if you, have, if you don't have that, we still display the parameter name, but of course there will be no description. So for, the, for you as the, I, the PowerShell expert, that might be okay. If you think about giving this to somebody in service desk, you might want to change that in your script. So that's great. So you can refactor it so it's a little bit easier to use. So another question is, um, can you, can you, I'm not sure I'm gonna get this right, Jim, because I lost the, the content of the chat, but uh, can you open up these up as REST endpoints that you can interact with? I think I'm saying uh, that. Yes, yes. And I'm going to cover that when we look at the, the automation connectors. So that's exactly, <laughs> What I, what I, uh, what I uh, mentioned when I said, okay, there are three ways of triggering scripts with script runner. One is manually. Somebody starts it with a user interface. Second is the scheduled approach. The third one is using the REST API to have a third party system or maybe a power uh, uh, SharePoint workflow or a power app that triggers an action uh, and tells us, okay, that's the action. These are the parameters. These are the parameter values and then you can trigger it. You can trigger that exactly via a REST API. Yeah. Great. And maybe you'll cover this later. Somebody was also asking about the licensing costs of, of this product, but I don't know if you're gonna cover that later or not, or what you Yeah, I, I would, I would come back to that at, at, at the end of the, of the, when I, when I did the demo. Okay, that's great. Okay. That's fine. Thanks. All right. So, um, yeah. Um, Okay, so here we're still uh, in this in this uh, process of, of creating this action, and um, of course we don't want to bother the user with all these parameters because typically you would say, okay, what kind of what kind of uh, in this case what kind of teams would you like to would would we like to allow? Should they be able to create new uh, channels and stuff like that? So these are all things that you can configure, and then say hide this parameter from the input form. And so, which means it's still being used when we execute the script, but it's not going to be visible to the user because number one, it's not, they don't have to change it. So why, why show it to them? Um, the other aspect is here, of course, right now the, the team that created didn't contain any user, which doesn't make really sense. So here we have the user parameter and instead of uh, letting the user typing things like, okay, these are these users I want to own groups I want to enable here in Teams. We have uh, these query elements, which for example, could be uh, a query that gives me back all the list of my Office 65 users, which means if I'm taking this action and running again, um, we will see that I still have this display name over here and down here where we have the user we get this list of, in this case, my users in my of 65 talent, which obviously are all kind of musicians. Um, so, and this query concept extremely simplifies the whole process and makes sure users are not able to do the wrong thing because they can only select what you have pre-configured in your query. Um, and it also um, makes sure the users are really only seeing what you want them to see. Let's say if somebody is responsible for only a particular tenant or a particular OU in your Active Directory, you can just have a query saying, okay, this is what I present to, the, to this group of users in help desk. 
and other people might be global help desk people, they're going to see all the users in your active directory. And so this concept of queries uh, is, is, is extremely helpful. And it's something that you can use for Active Directory. We just added uh, also having um, Azure Active Directory queries, um, also including Microsoft Graph stuff. Of course, you can have query scripts, which is the most flexible way of doing it because you could query things from your vSphere environment, from your Shepherd environment and stuff like that. Uh, you can even have uh, uh, um, static queries, which I'm also going to show you in, a, in an example here. Um, so that's really something that that's completely simplifies um, what, what the user experience looks like. And so at the end, if, if we say, okay, we have an action, I have tested it, it looks so fine, it looks fine. Um, I wanna make it available to my users. I can say, okay, now I'm starting to, um, to delegate that. And um, no, not scheduling, that's the wrong button. I want to delegate, which means I could say, okay, um, what are the users, what are the teams that should be able to use this action? I can also work with this multiple language functionality here. I can even think about having kind of a color scheme saying all my team's actions are orange, all my Azure actions are blue. So people are becoming kind of familiar with how this thing work. And, and if that happens, then, then we are kind of leaving this admin context and we're coming to the service desk people and the service desk people working with the delegation. And then here we already see um, the new script vendor portal, which is a role-based portal, the portal that we just uh, released actually today. Um, this has been the, the old way, so to speak, which still works, of course. And this is, this is the new one, uh, which also, of course, uh, um, provides this different languages. So if I'm using this, I'm starting this action, I'm having, again, I see the, this parameters that I want the people to be able to see. Um, I, can, I can, in this case, again, I can select my, my users for, for this team and I can start the execution of that script in the background. And again, very important uh, here, I'm, I'm logged in as user Tina. She's just a normal domain user. So, so the context of how the script is actually executed is always the script runner engine runs the script. It's not the user. That's why the user can don't have to have any permissions in the backend system that we just talked about. It's just something that, that you decide within the delegation to say this user should be able to trigger this, and then script runner takes care of the rest. And all the activities they end up in in our dashboard. So in our dashboard, you can see all kinds of execution of scripts. So here we can see, okay, there was this user Tina. And obviously, maybe if I'm going to the reports details, I can still see, oh no, it's already finished. Okay, so here now I can see, okay, this was user Tina. She created um, that team by starting this action. Again, this was the target and that was the credential. This has been the parameter values. And as we saw, only a few of them have been visible, but all the other things, of course, are being used while we execute that. And then we get the result back of what actually happened. and. Um, if we go back to this one here, I, I see this list and I might not, I'm, maybe I might say, okay, that's fine, but um, I want to make it look a little bit uh, nicer. Uh, and that brings me to the good old ISE. Uh, why? Because I ha we have this script runner plugin for ISE that kind of a little bit helps me to organize uh, my scripts with some little bit of... Um, check in and check out mechanisms um, where I, for example, can say, okay, I can check out the script and I might want to change the behavior of the script in the sense of uh, number one, uh, of course, I want to make my user mandatory as a parameter and number two, I might want to have a little bit more of a, of a nice uh, feedback when this team has been created. Uh, and so I can just check that in again. So uh, a couple of questions when you're ready. Yes, please go ahead. So one of the questions is that uh, some qu some queries can take a long time. Is there a way to cache the results? Excellent questions. I like that. Yeah, 
um, just go back, let, let's go there, right? which is especially true for all the things in the cloud, right? So, so let's take this example for this Office 65 um, query that we just saw with the users, um, which is this one here. And um, of course, and that's exactly uh, one of the reasons why we have um, scheduled queries, which means you could say, okay, the query for getting this information from Office 65 is scheduled in my case once every two hours. So if a user opens the action, the result of the, when the latest would be from two hours ago is available immediately. And I can show, I can also take a look at the, at the results here uh, and to see, okay, when was the last refresh and, and stuff like that. So that's one of the very important things to make sure the user experience is nice, it's fast, the data is there, they don't have to wait for 20 seconds, so the query has been executed. Um, so th this is something that you can definitely configure with within Script Runner and makes this, uh, yeah, it just makes the users happy because they don't have to wait until this the, this list pops up of the uh, what uh, of the users here. Um, also, is there so you showed uh, you showed ICE? Is there a Visual Studio Code plugin that you have? Uh, not in f not in full like what we have here. Um, but, and this is something else that's quite interesting because I think as I showed you that uh, this, 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 uh, this array that we add, uh, which is the SRX environment uh, variables, um, which you can use for, for example, find out who triggered that action from which IP address, because maybe you want to uh, start a team's cache deletion on exactly that machine that, that somebody clicked on the tile. So this information, uh, using uh, to f to find out what is uh, the values, the current value status of my variables. This is a plugin that is available for for um, Visual Studio Code. So you can go um, uh, to the PowerShell gallery and download that and use it within within uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, the functionality that we see here with check in, check out, it's not available, and we. We see people that working with Visual Studio Code typically have all that code management going on in, in GitHub or something like this. So we don't really see the need to have that, that available uh, in Visual Studio Code. Okay, sounds good. All right, um, so uh, just let's go back to this action here um, because what, 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 what I just did and hopefully worked is that I want to switch that plain text result message that we just saw that what happened in the background that to switch this to something that that kind of looks a little bit nicer to the user which would be an html uh, result message that that hopefully comes back here you know, but we'll we'll see i will come back to this uh, once it's once it's done um, so um, another use case of course where where these queries help a lot is um, for example, if you have things like people sh in your uh, HR department should be able to trigger out of office notifications if, if somebody calls in sick, um, because there are there are two actually two things that might be helpful. One thing is people should not write any fancy text for the notifications, so you want to have a template for vacation for sick leave, for example. And because there is a, a date time parameter, we automatically translate that into a date picker. So it becomes very easy for the user, again, to work with that. And I, here I have a parameter set saying, okay, I want to have a scheduled. Uh, again, here I have the selection of my users and I click on okay, and it's being executed in the background. Now, this is another way of using queries, um, which is just a static list of notifications. And, and this pretty much, uh, shows the whole structure and idea how this query works. There is always, there's kind of two columns. One is the display value. What is the user that, what is the user able to select, which is the left side. And the right side is the technical information that's being used when we execute the script, which also in this case includes, we have start date end date variable, which helps us to take the right date into the text when we uh, configure this uh, out of office notification. Um, and another good example here is if we uh, look for, uh, if, if we take an example for, for Azure, because when, when we look at, at, at the Azure configuration uh, for, for Azure VMs, we might say, okay, this uses 
you, we want to enable to spin up new VMs, but it shouldn't be the most expensive one, not the mega beast or stuff like that. So what happens here is again, based on the queries, you say, okay, these are the two specifications that you can select. These are the locations that are available to you. And again, this is the display value. The technical value back in the, in the query, of course, will be that's the exact name of the Azure size and the name of this location, for example. Um, so again, this is something that really helps to, to organize that, that whole structure. Uh, ah, yeah, just here. Okay, so just to go back to this one here. So now this is a little bit nicer. Um, so giving back the information about, okay, user Tina created that team that has been the settings. Um, I could have this as a, as a HTML report and maybe um, store it as well. Um, so just to, again, to make it easier for the user, a little bit nicer to work with that. Uh, something else I want to show you, if I still have time, um, would be... Yeah, yeah, I, have I have? Yep. Okay, okay. I hope people don't get bored. So um, just stop me <laughs> if it's too much. Um, here, I am, here I am on a Windows 10 client and uh, the idea here is, okay, um, the user has a problem with, uh, with, with Teams and um, it, it's the solution hopefully would be clear the local Teams cache uh, on this very machine. And this is an action that I can hopefully trigger here. So I click on run, there is no parameter. I can just activate that. Um, it should close my team um, application in the background hopefully, uh, and once that's done, it should uh, clean my Teams cache, which in this case, I think there are seven folders in the background that has to be deleted. And okay, <laughs> having again, some fancy uh, background here. So it, it shows me, okay, obviously the team has, the Teams cache has been deleted on this very machine. And that's a very interesting use case when it comes to how to uh, remotely, of course, uh, work with PowerShell and with Script Runner, because if I'm going to go back to that script um, that does the trick, which is here cleaning the cache, um, we can see the use case of taking one of our variables, which is the started IP address, uh, and turn it into the right computer name. So when we process that script, um, script runner, of course, again, of course, the script is execu executed on the script runner machine, and it, and but it, of course, it's going to uh, talk to that computer where I clicked on the child, and that's because we we have this information here. We also have the information about the user. Um, which also helps you to control the behavior within your scripts. Like maybe somebody clicks on, tries to trigger something from a, let's say a, a, a network segment that is where you're not allowed to do that, for example. Uh, and then you could just say, okay, if that's uh, coming from the right, uh, from the wrong uh, IP address, so to speak, you stop the, the whole process, for example. Um, so this really helps also to, to control the behavior of your scripts. So, uh, Heiko, question yes. on that. So, can you provide a uh, user access to a generated file download? Like, if you created an Excel file, can you lock it down, I guess, to a particular user or set of users? Uh, in, in, in the sense of, so the user should be able to upload that or to download an, an, ex download. an existing download. Yeah, yeah you, you, you could implement that into, into that uh, user interface based on your scripts, of course. That, okay. that is something that you can do as well. Um, and something else I want to show you is because we talked about this, this query and these queries can be also um, cascading ones, uh, which I just want to show you in a simple example, um, which is this one here. Uh, no, this one. Um, what does this mean? So you might say, okay, a user, there might be different selections the user should take. And that should be, in this case, it should be a, a three-step approach. So. What I can do here is I can say, okay, I want to get some information. And it starts with, okay, select the OU first. Once I have selected the OU, I get all the groups in this case that I have in my OU. And once I have selected the group, I see I get the members of this group. Um, again, the, the, the goal here is to make it easy for the user and to make it 
controllable and manageable, what kind of information is visible. In another use case, the selection, these three steps might be select uh, the, Hyper-V, the Hyper-V server, select the VM and the according snapshots, for example, or uh, SharePoint server, or SharePoint site, and uh, whatever information uh, you would, the people would like to be able to select here. Um, and so with this cascading queries, you can do even more cool stuff um, to again, make it, make it comfortable for the user and controllable and manageable from your side. And that brings us to the second way of how to use script runner. So until now we talked about somebody clicks on a tile and a uh, user does something. Uh, which, okay, I, I want to show you something else because we showed, we looked at our script runner user interface. Now what's possible with script runner is also to say, okay, you might have a self-service portal. You might have, I don't know, a SharePoint website um, where users are already working with. And inside of this uh, portal, you want to just have one of these actions that, that we looked at and being integrated into that well-known familiar web interface uh, where the users are working in day in day out. And that's exactly what you can do with our new portal widget, um, which here is exactly the same uh, that we just saw when, we, when it was about spinning up a new VM in Azure. So instead of going to the script runner uh, solution and, and getting familiar with, with, with how it works, you could just say, okay, I can take this, I can, I can, I can take each and every action and integrate that into my portal here, which is just done by a simple iframe. So, which means every action in our configuration has a dedicated ID. And with this ID, I can say, okay, um, creating an Azure VM, this ID 158. Um, I want to show the description of the action, or maybe not, which I can control here with the parameters. And then it's embedded in the look and feel of the of this website, and it becomes even more easy for the user. And it's even less necessary that users are know anything about PowerShell but because this is just it's just a web user interface, and the, all the stuff, the great stuff that goes on underneath with with, with PowerShell is organized and managed with Script Runner in somewhere in the background. And so that that's really, I think, a very cool way. Another way actually, by the way, of, of using that uh, and, and, con- and controlling, of course, script runner would be, for example, to take a, uh, a power app or a power automate um, um, app and say, okay, creating a new team should be something that also happens um, with, uh, with a power app, for example, where we have a custom connector that knows based on, on a Swagger file that we create, what kind of actions are available. And then this connector talks to an, to my on-premise uh, Microsoft data uh, gateway uh, that in turn then uh, talks to script runner. Um, so this is just another way of how you can trigger actions within script runner. Second uh, layer, so to speak, is scheduled. So of course, besides the manual, usage you can say okay i have i have actions that should run every hour like this one this is where i'm where i'm um controlling i'm, I'm just doing here a, a a sync from my github repo down to script runner whenever there is a new uh, or updated script of course for other pro- purposes there would be maybe something that only happens on 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 weekends or something like this um then if you do a scheduled one, you might also activate the email notification so people know um, if something went wrong. In other cases, okay, you might want to use webhooks to push things into, of course, into Teams, um, which is another, of course, great way of informing people here. Um, so this is where, for example, also these target collections come into the picture where you can say, okay, I want to run my housekeeping process every weekend through all my Windows servers and all my Azure subscriptions or stuff like that. And this is where the scheduled approach um, is being used. And the third one is, uh, and we already had these questions about uh, having this REST API. So we are having what we call automation connectors, which is basically uh, a generic REST API. 
um, which in my case, I have a PHG monitoring system uh, available here. And um, I'm allowing this system to talk to script runner. It has to authenticate. That's very important because based on, based on the authentication, we check if this machine is actually allowed to trigger the action that it tries us to, to, to trigger. Um, so in this case, um, I'm not sure, I hope it works. Let's see, I have a very stupid example here, which means if I'm stopping uh, uh, the Windows team service on my domain controller, which of course we shouldn't do, but this is how it works. Um, if I do that, my PATG system should detect there is a sensor uh, monitoring that machine. Um, it should detect there is an issue and then PATG should talk to a script runner. And as a result, we should see something like this here in my team channel that tells me there is something wrong with my uh, time service. Um, and so of course, and then of course, in addition, of course, we would reset the service and we do whatever is necessary. Um, but this is this is the way. Uh, and here it is. Okay, so it tells us. Okay, this was this is this actually are variables are coming from PRDG that we're using. Like, what's the name of the service? What's the name of the machine? Uh, what are the details that that we get back from from this PRDG system? And we use it in this case just to trigger an alert in a Microsoft Team channel. Plus, of course, uh, again starting starting uh, the service not new or whatever is necessary. Um, so this is the, the way how you can kind of take, for example, also what I briefly just showed you with the Power Automate. Uh, it also talks, it, there is also the web service connector being involved in making this, making this possible. And based on that, you can really, any, any system that you have that, that, that is able to talk REST, you can integrate with script runner. And if you have kind of legacy systems, we also have an email inbound connector, which means if, if a system is not able to talk REST, but they can send uh, mails in the right formatted way. That also can be a trigger though. So we are monitoring an IMAP mailbox constantly to see if there is a new ticket, so to speak, to trigger an action within. Okay, uh, I have, uh, so somebody also asked, um, so in both web request and in both REST method is supported? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, which is quite interesting because especially for this PADG uh, scenario, um, because based on that, it's, this is kind of a two-way uh, approach. One thing is PADG can trigger a script runner to, to trigger um, actions and to trigger scripts. But in, another way would be you would like to change configuration within PADG, uh, which could be, okay, I want to enable a set of, a set of um, sensors, for example, which in turn really in, in the script that does that is actually exactly using invoke web, web, web request to chocolate PATG to make that happen. And that of course, again, works with every system that, that is kind of um, restified here. Um, okay, so do you wanna, let's uh, maybe you can talk about the licensing and then we can do the raffle. Does that make yes, sense? Yes, yes, sure. Maybe, maybe just one last thing I want to show sure. you before we do that, uh, sure. which is something that, that really is new and I think really helps with our new portal, which is, um, the efficiency uh, dashboard. So to find out, okay, you have configured a number of actions and it and script runner now works for three weeks. I wanna know how much time and how much money actually uh, got being saved by doing things in an automatic way. And so this is something that we provide with this dashboard, which shows you the, the, the time and the money that you have uh, saved. And you can, of course, you can, you can uh, uh, take, and download this as CSV or, or print it or something like this. So if we talk about people uh, yeah, getting this information to management and to see, okay, what is actually, what do we gain if we start automating? Or what have we done the last four weeks? How much time did we, did we save? So this is really something, I mean, management typically likes, but it's also really something that helps the, the, the administrators to see, okay, what actually happens in the, um, in the background. Okay, so with this um, licensing, um, so let me just go to our website. I think that's the best way because there we have a little page that, 
that describes what's happening here is a licensing page. So we have kind of two flavors of script runner. One is the essential edition, which is kind of a the starting point, which uh, uh, comes with, with five users. It's a yearly subscription. And that is uh, roughly $1,900 per year as a subscription, where you can start um, working with script runner. And then we have the corporate suite, which allows you to add connectors, uh, so password connectors, REST, REST API connectors and stuff like that. Uh, and that starts with 10 users. And so for the details, um, if people would like to get some more detailed information about that, it, I'm very happy to, to, um, to send you some detailed information on that. Um, so, but for the starting point, uh, the essential edition is something that really, uh, yeah, is, is, is something that you can start with playing around with script runner, getting your first use cases to work and really getting that most annoying recurring tasks, starting to delegate to, to people in help desk or maybe to even to end users. And then step-by-step, step, of course, you can add new functionality there um, over time. Um, uh, and so this is also the, let's say the typical, the typical uh, journey, let's say, and career of, of a script on a customer. Uh, we say, okay, we are starting with, with, start with bringing functionality to the delegation to service desk people, maybe even to end users, and then integrating that using connectors uh, so that script runner can be triggered by other systems. And then that step by, and of course you can add the connectors uh, over time and additional ones step by step. So that's, that's how that typically works. All right, um, so I would go back to my slide. So, 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 so we can kick off the raffle, if that's Excellent. okay. Sounds perfect. So, so number one, uh, you might want to, you might want to go to uh, this website here. Uh, I think I have a QR code that might help you. And I also gonna post the link into the chat, just a second. Just a second. So, so this is a little Microsoft form. Let me just see. Oops, da -da -da. into the chat. There is the chat. All right. So, so, so if you want to, yeah, win one of these two Amazon gift cards that we give away. Um, I don't want to put this privately. Okay. I'll, it should be something for everyone. So here is the link. Um, so if you want, you can just type in your email address. And um, so I think we'll wait maybe a few minutes. Yeah, I think uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to also stop the recording for now. Does that sound okay. make sense? Okay. Okay. Excellent. All right. So let me stop that.